Good evening and welcome. I'm Eric Damian Kelly, Dean of the College of Architecture and Planning, and it's my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. As many of you know, uh, one major part of our lecture and exhibit series this year we're calling Celebrating the Circle City. And it's a real privilege to have here with us tonight one of the reasons we have the opportunity to celebrate the Circle City. Um, although he claims his name is William H. Hudnut III, one of the pictures in reading about former Mayor Hudnut, one of the pictures that has always enchanted me is the picture of William O. Hudnut marching down the avenue leading the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And of course, as a Kelly, I greatly appreciated that. <laughs> but it's a great privilege to have here uh, William Hudnut, who was mayor of Indianapolis for 16 years and has had a great deal to do with the renaissance of Indianapolis and the reason we can celebrate it. As many of you probably know, he's also been a minister, he's been a member of Congress, and currently he is a senior research fellow at the Urban Land Institute. He uh, was a graduate of Princeton University, which has given him its Woodrow Wilson Award for Public Service, but an award that would interest many of you, and it responds, someone, one of the architects said, well, gee, why do we need a mayor talking to us in a design lecture series? Well, of course, great design doesn't happen without patrons, and to do a building like the Alumni Center, it takes only an institutional or an individual patron. But to create a great urban design, to create a city environment that is vital and exciting, it takes a patron in the form of city government. And having that kind of leadership to make great design, to make revitalization happen, is critical. And our speaker tonight is a person who has done that. And one of the re that is a principal reason that he is one of the recipients of AIA Indiana's Gibson Award, which is its highest award for design achievement to non-architects. It is my great privilege to introduce to you former Mayor William H. Hudnut III. Bill? Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Kelly. I appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you uh, this evening. Uh, I guess it's true that I did get that award, but I'm not sure that it's true that I know too much about design. In fact, probably less than anybody else in the room, but it's a, a pleasure to have a chance to talk with you about the revitalization of Indianapolis and some broader interests that I have that uh, might or might not be of interest to you. I hope they are. Uh, and I, I thought that the way to divide this uh, program up, since we have an hour together, would be to uh, talk abstractly or philosophically for the first uh, half of it, and then the second half show you some slides and pictures of Indianapolis which try to, in, in graphic imagery, depict some of the principles that I think are important that we tried to implement while I was in Indianapolis and have been implemented since. The things that I think go to make up a, uh, a city, and I would be a remiss if I did not acknowledge the presence here this evening of Harold Rominger, who was the chief planner for the city while I was uh, in office. But Harold, it's nice to see you. Stand up, take a bow. Way over in the corner. When I uh, was elected mayor of Indianapolis in 1975, uh, I drew the conclusion that if we didn't do something to try to reinforce the core of our city, it was in danger of becoming a donut with all the development taking place out around the periphery. And I didn't think that would be healthy uh, for the city. It was symbolized by th this kind of centrifugal movement farther out, was sim symbolized by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which had moved uh, their offices out into a more or less suburban uh, site, which I thought was kind of paradoxical, uh, way out at about uh, 50th and Allisonville Road, if you can uh, visualize that in your mind. And that's a little bit far removed from urban development and housing and all that sort of business. But they eventually moved back down to downtown Indianapolis, and their headquarters are now in the Gold Building. But that's, in my opinion, uh, symbolic of the problem that we had and the solution that we have. The problem being people flying from the suburb, to the suburbs from the central city. Suburbanization's been going on since uh, World War 
uh, too, and it has sucked a lot of vitality out of the city, and a lot of brains and a lot of resources have, have fled outward, and there's been all across urban America a hollowing out of the major cities of our country. As one biographer of Ed Rendell, the great mayor of Philadelphia, puts it, Philadelphia is suffering from inexorable demographic rot as people move out to escape the perceived problems in the city. And Ed Rendell himself said, in spite of everything that I've tried to do, Philadelphia is dying. Now, I don't think that's the end of the story. I think there are signs of hope. And what I want to do this evening is to talk about some of those signs, uh, setting it in the context of what I consider to be one characteristic of a successful city as we turn the corner into the new century. And that characteristic is this, that the successful city of the future will have a vibrant, strong downtown. It will combat bad sprawl and practice what I call, uh, and many others call, smart growth. So when I became mayor of Indianapolis, and I saw this donut beginning to shape, take shape in the circle city, I said, we've got to hold the core. Somehow we have to combat those centrifugal tendencies with centripetal ones that will focus the city back in on its resources in the downtown area and in the inner ring suburbs uh, on the assumption that you can't be a suburb of nothing, on the assumption that it's uh, important to create an edge by creating a center, on the assumption that our public policy would be to encourage urban reinvestment to counteract urban disinvestment without at the same time discouraging suburban investment. And I hope that during the course of the 16 years that I served as mayor, and in case some of you aren't familiar with Indianapolis, I'm pleased to tell you that I left office voluntarily in 1991. There are three ways to leave office, and two of them aren't any good. Uh, but I thought I'd been mayor long enough, and it was time to move on and time for the city to get some new leadership. But I hope during that 16 years, we were able to develop uh, a successful uh, downtown core for our city. Now, I'm very concerned, and so is the Urban Land Institute where I work. It's a not-for-profit research and uh, education institution in, based in Washington, D.C., and supported entirely by its membership, has about 15,000 members across the country and internationally, uh, many developers, uh, some uh, architects and designers and marketing people, academics, some public agencies, a very fine group of individuals. It doesn't lobby. It's not a uh, lobbying organization for the real estate industry at all. But what it's interested in is smart growth. What it's interested in is smart land use. Its mission statement says that it is it is, its charge is to develop responsible leadership in the use of the land in order to enhance the total environment. So I'd like to begin by sharing with you some thoughts about uh, sprawl and some thoughts about characteristics of smart growth and then go to the uh, slides basically of uh, the Indianapolis experience while I was mayor. I'd like to begin by defining smart growth by what it is not. <laughs> It, it, it's, uh, it, it's not dumb growth, but there's a lot of dumb growth around. The question is not whether or not we're going to grow. The question is how are we going to grow and where are we going to grow? Because I think growth is inevitable as the American population expands, as business opportunities expand, and so forth and so on. The question is, are we going to let what I call bad sprawl continue? And I try to differentiate in a, a book that was just published a week ago between bad sprawl and good sprawl. But smart growth is not bad sprawl. It is not the endless sameness of structures lacking distinctive form or character. It is not blobs distending in every direction from the core of the city. 
It is not cookie cutter subdivisions and strip malls connected by six and eight and 10 lane roads leapfrogging over each other and gobbling up precious land. Smart growth is not crowded highways and huge parking lots and big box stores and homogeneous buildings and row upon row of monolithic housing with no walkable streets, all of it accompanied by air and water and ground pollution, abandoned buildings, smog and low density single use patterns of development unrelieved by open spaces or friendly amenities. Somebody has called bad sprawl promiscuous consumption. I was, I was at a meeting last week in the bluegrass region of Kentucky where there's a Bluegrass Tomorrow organization which was sponsoring this, uh, this uh, study, this seminar, the charrette, whatever you want to call it, about 250 people were there on what's going to happen to the bluegrass region around Lexington, Kentucky, if we permit what they call this creeping crud to continue. And they had a map on the wall of where development is today and where the green space is today. And it's a beautiful countryside, if any of you have ever been down there. And they're scared to death that it's all going to be gobbled up by development. And then they showed a map of what would happen in that region if sprawl were allowed to continue and the pattern of development were allowed to continue as it's going now. And while there was a lot of green on the map on one side, on the other side there was nothing but red blobs all around and the green space was destroyed. And they said that's what we don't want our city to become. Now how can we have a more sensible approach to growth? How can we develop an intelligent smart growth policy? I'm not against growth per se. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, concerned about bad growth and urban and sub suburban areas growing toward each other along transportation corridors so that pretty soon there are no lines of demarcation, no green space, no open space, but just lots of congestion and, and pollution. I think the costs of bad sprawl are numerous. And I think they're serious. And I think there are a lot of people that don't recognize them. The statistics tell us that 8 out of 10 people, or 8 out of 10 families, want to live in the suburbs. And their dream is the realization of the old American dream that we can have our place out in the burbs with good schools and good infrastructure and an acre or so of green grass and nice uh, crime-free zones. And all the rest of it, unlimited low density growth. It's the American dream. And most people still feel that way, but I'd like to think there are some trends um, pointing back toward the center of the city. And one of those trends has to do with people beginning to understand the costs of bad sprawl. Let me just enumerate them quickly. First of all, it consumes land that has other legitimate purposes. The American Farm Land Trust tells us that 45.6 acres of land in America are being consumed by development every hour of every day. Now you do that arithmetic and that's a lot of acres being consumed by sprawl. In Chicago, between the years 1970 and 1990, there was a 4% increase in the population but there was a 46% increase in the occupied land area. Sprawl. In Seattle, the population increased 36%, but the percent of occupied land area increased 87%. In Philadelphia, the figures were 4% population growth, 32% increase in occupied land. So, Sprawl consumes land that has other purposes, including being left alone, being left green, or turned into farmland outside of what some cities call their urban, urban growth boundary areas or belts. Two, bad sprawl increases traffic congestion. Don't have to tell you that. There's a Florida study that says that those living in the most accessible locations spend 40 minutes less per day in cars than households living in the least accessible location, thus ge generating hundreds of fewer vehicle hours per year. Bad sprawl increases air pollution, 
by increasing the bad effects of congestion. It increases road rage. There's a lot of that now. And around Washington on the Beltway, there are signs warning you that the radar is watching not just your speed, but also whether or not you're weaving in and out of lanes and honking at people and uh, carrying on with what is called road rage. Bad sprawl limits pedestrian access to out-of-home activities. That's why we have a generation of soccer moms now. It increases congestion. Third, it has hidden costs for the taxpayers. The Center for Urban Studies at Rutgers University uh, ran a study of this and came to the conclusion that seven to eight billion dollars between the early 1990s and 20 years out would be spent in the state of New Jersey for new roads, new sewers, new schools and so forth, new infrastructure because of sprawl and that that computed out to some fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per household in New Jersey. Now that's pretty serious. In Little Rock, Arkansas, annexation a while back produced eight to nine million dollars of revenue increase but the commercial disinvestment that accompanied that and the housing abandonment that were probably a consequence of bringing in this outer area generated net costs of $32 million during the same period. In Rochester, New York, the write down of downtown land by the city for 77 units of apartments was uh, hailed as a great thing for downtown Rochester. But, says one of the newspapers in Rochester, the project will be subsidized by taxpayers. And it goes on, if Greater Wa Rochester were not a wash in suburban sprawl, if we were not building new housing developments farther and farther out, we would not need to underwrite housing on vacant la city land. There'd be enough demand for downtown housing to build it without subsidies. I think also bad sprawl, in addition to these things, it, it also degrades the environment. By bulldozing green spaces and wetlands, destroying biodiversity through habitat fragmentation, New Jersey says that sprawl consumes two and a half times as much land as compact development and leads to a loss of five times as much environmentally sensitive land. I think it is possible to have smart growth and environmental sensitivity at the same time. Uh, fifth, if you're keeping track, bad sprawl contributes to economic polarization, creating one, what one writer has called a kind of American apartheid. It creates a giant sucking sound, to quote Ross Perot in a different context. People who can't afford a car get shut out and locked in so that mayors all through America during the 1980s were able to tell the evolving story of a tale of two cities, one out there in the sunshine of opportunity, the other in the shadows. It contributes to more taxes and more development in reverse order. In other words, out in the suburbs where the development occurs, it helps the tax base, but down in the central city where the development tends not to occur, taxes have to go up to take care of the people who are concentrated there in poverty because they're locked out of the growth farther out. The reality of unplanned growth brings about a type of economic triage wherein a finite amount of money is allocated to prepare and access new areas while old areas are left to die. These are the middle stage signs of a region that is becoming non-competitive and whose end state is a major loss of economic tenants. So says this study at the Center for Urban Policy in Rutgers. And then finally, I think another cost of sprawl, which we're not perhaps aware of, but if we think about it, maybe we are, is that it contributes to a loss of a sense of community a loss of a sense of place, a loss of a feeling of roots. I talked to a woman who lives in Paradise Valley, a beautiful suburban enclave outside of Phoenix. Very, very wealthy suburban enclave. Irma Bomback lives there and famous people live there and they've got these multi-jillion dollar houses and all the rest of it. But she says there's no community here. 
She says, I grew up in a New, New Jersey town where, where we could walk, where we could get around without having to get in the car. She says, I pined for that. I longed for that. But we don't have it out here in Paradise Valley. James Howard Kunstler, who has a way with words, says, kids need shops and cultural institutions and access to these things without the assistance of the family chauffeur. In suburbia, the only public realm for children is the psychotic principality of television. Sprawl has its psychological and social costs. Well, smart growth is an antidote to urban sprawl. Maybe it's a specious distinction I'm trying to draw, but I, I try to draw it in this book that I've referenced, uh, between bad sprawl and good sprawl, or between bad growth and good growth. Sprawl is growth, and growth is sprawl. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. Bad sprawl pursues unlimited low-density growth. Good sprawl appreciates the ability of higher densities to conserve land. Bad sprawl tramples on the environment. Smart growth respects it. Bad sprawl eschews comprehensive planning. Good sprawl embraces planned communities in the suburbs, the inner ring, and downtown. Bad sprawl practices monolithic single-use land use patterns. Smart growth believes in mixed uses and flexibility in the regulatory process. Bad sprawl leapfrogs. Good sprawl proceeds concurrently with public infrastructure and services. Bad sprawl believes that big is better. Smart growth sees beauty in the small. Bad sprawl forces people into their cars. Good sprawl gets them out. Bad sprawl loves asphalt and concrete. Good sprawl loves green space. So what are the elements of smart growth? Before I get to the slides, let me just tick off uh, 10 of them. I think first, planning in advance. Or if you please, pre-designation planning, or, or, pre, uh, or planning pre-designation. That'd be a better way to put it. My father loved to play chess, and uh, one day he, he was a pretty good chess player, and one day he was in uh, New York City, and he was browsing through some of the antique stores and bookshops on Lower Broadway, and he was gazing at a chess set that looked pretty attractive to him, thinking about buying it when the weasened old proprietor came out of the store and says, you want to play a game of chess? And my father said, sure. So they sat down and started in a chess game. And within 10 minutes, my father was standing up, shaking hands with the fellow, saying, uh, congratulations, you're a good chess player. And if you play chess, you know that it takes a long time, usually. And my father said to this uh, old man, he said, what's the secret of your game? How come you're so good? And he said, well, that's easy. He said, I begin at the end of the game and work backwards. In Indianapolis in the late 1970s, we tried to envision where we wanted to be in the year 2000. And so we developed a, a regional vision plan for the year 2000 for the area inside the interstate loop in downtown Indianapolis. We invited citizens to come in and give us their dreams and criticize the planners' drawings that were on the board and so forth. And we got 2,000 pieces of input into the computers from citizens saying, we think this should be this or this should be that. Pre-planning, pre-permitting subdivisions, laying out streets and open spaces and parks and city services in advance, providing for the physical framework of growth as well as the incentives to guide development to places that make sense fiscally and socially and environment is smart growth. Focusing new investments in existing neighborhoods and town centers is smart growth. Historic preservation is smart growth. Fifteen governors in the, their state of the state addresses this past January referenced smart growth. Maryland has a smart growth law that they put on the books. They say you can develop anywhere you want, but if you don't develop in our pre-designated areas for growth, we're not going to subsidize you with infrastructure development that we pay for. Thank you all. Are you from Maryland? Uh, as somebody who stole the Colts from Baltimore, I'm glad always to have something good to say about Maryland. <laughs> uh, in Tennessee, they have a new program requiring planners, government leaders, and citizens to be set up uh, this year to devise growth boundaries for cities and counties by the year 2000. In Massachusetts, former Governor Weld in introduced an executive order 
uh, that said, we assume that unplanned growth not only harms our environment, but also hurts our economic competitiveness. competitiveness. Therefore, I direct the agencies in our government to pursue sustainable economic development and resource protection through interagency proactive planning and coordination. And Governor Whitman in New Jersey says the same thing and on and on and on. One, smart growth means planning advance. Two, it means planning together, collaboration. That's what our Vision 2000 program in Indianapolis was all about as we put that uh, little uh, office of the Metropolitan Development Department down on the circle. Uh, all over the country, regions are getting together to plan. They recognize the interdependence of suburbs and cities, and they're getting together, and business, I might say, is leading the way in this. They're getting together to see how they can plan better for their regions, recognizing that the paradigm has shifted. And now it's global, and regional, and neighborhood, whereas it used to be federal, state, and local. Not that that's not important, but rather that people's thinking has to take the shape of global thinking and regional thinking as well as local neighborhood thinking. And all that regionalism really is is metropolitan-wide thinking and planning and acting, but it is a characteristic of smart growth. Regional teamwork and teamwork between the public and the private sector and eliciting comments and input from grassroots citizenry and giving them a chance to participate in the decision-making process. Three, smart growth means commitment to green space, to open space, to conservation, to an ethic of good stewardship of the very finite resources that we have in this country of ours. A national survey says that consumers value lots of natural open space, like walking and biking trails, I know a place in uh, uh, St. Elmo, Minnesota, called the Field of St. Croix, where 226 acres were rezoned from 10-acre lots to a cluster plan that produces four times the density, but 60% more open space. People want green space. They want green space conserved, and green fields conserved, just as they want brown fields cleaned up. Fourth. Smart growth involves a, a commitment to compact mixed uses in traditional towns and neighborhoods. In other words, to higher densities. Now this is a no-no to many people. Many people are afraid of higher density. They're afraid it will produce crime. They're afraid that it will warehouse people in Pruitt Igos or Cabrini Greens. They don't understand that it's possible to have higher densities and have nice dwellings in which to live. In, uh, there aren't any cookie cutter approaches. I was going to say in the big cities, 80 to 100 units per acre may be dense. In infill housing, 12 to 15. And then there are places like in suburban Salt Lake City where 40 acre lots seem to be the order of the day. I was uh, at a party the other night in suburban Washington on a 40 acre lot. It was just incredible to me. This young fellow, he couldn't have been more than 38 years old with his family. His, oldest kid is six or something like that. But he'd, he'd been the uh, founder or the president of Nextel, and he was a multi-jillionaire. And he had an 18,000 square foot home, a tennis court, barns for his horses, a swimming pool, a guest house, as well as his own pad. It just blew my mind. One house on 40 acres. That's not really what you might call higher density. But I think that there is a national trend toward more compact clustered development characterized by a mix of uses with highly interconnected vehicular and pedestrian networks and quality amenities. Fifth, use of existing infrastructure. Florida has a principle of concurrency. The great, the idea there is that you don't want to disperse, sprawl, and then have infrastructure catch up with it, but you want to plan your growth where the infrastructure's already in place. And of course, you can expand it where it's appropriate. A sixth characteristic of uh, smart growth is the reuse of abandoned land and obsolete buildings. We tried to do a lot of that in Indianapolis, as with the uh, Indianapolis Rubber Factory, to uh, name just one, which now has become the Indiana Farm Bureau headquarters. 
We did it with infield ha infill housing, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, some states are making brownfield development easier and less risky by providing liability protection and favorable financing and discounted impact fees. People are turning lofts into condos all over the country and historic preservation is taking uh, a strong hold and I think it's important. I was terribly disappointed when the Tax Reform Act of 1986 passed and all of a sudden the historic preservation efforts in Indianapolis pretty well dried up because the wealthy people who could buy shares like in the condos where I lived uh, no longer had the appropriate tax treatment for them so they got out of the business and it's been more difficult since then as I understand it to do that. A seventh characteristic is transit oriented development. One thing smart growth tries to do is to decrease America's dependence on the automobile and I think that's very important. In other words, clustering development around transportation, focusing compact development on existing commercial centers and new town centers, and existing or planned uh, transportation centers. So these are some of the characteristics of sprawl that I, I think are important. Uh, finally, let me just say that the other three, and I've got to watch my time, eight is preserve habitat. Be sensitive to the environment. I know a wonderful architect in Philadelphia. She's a specialist in uh, the kind of uh, architecture that is called sustainable architecture, I guess. But she says, we have to learn to tread lightly on the earth. She quotes an old Indian adage. Old, uh, I'm sorry, old, <laughs> oh, that's a bad slip, an old Native American adage. We do not inherit the land from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Smart growth is sensitive to the environment, and cities must plan for conservation. Nine, smart growth recognizes traditional downtowns and neighborhoods as being important to the economic health of the region. And 10, and this again is a phrase from Kunstler, smart growth creates places worthy of our affection like neo-traditionalism or new urbanism, which there's a slide of here. Chicago has a campaign for sensible growth. I commend it to you for study. It's mounted by the uh, Chicago Metropolitan Planning Council. And its motivation is to try to help Chicago create livable communities. The campaign has arisen as a result of concerns over the depletion of land and the efficiency and social consequences of fragmented low density Development. The cost of this expansion, says their little campaign guidebook, is hitting the suburban taxpayers as more schools are built, roads are extended, and tolls are collected. People who moved in search of community and open space are finding instead traffic congestion, long commutes to work, and a loss of natural areas. And then it goes through five different categories of uh, thinking if you're going to try to plan smart rather than dumb for the future of your area out there in suburban Chicago. I'm not just talking about the downtowns. It says walkable neighborhoods are important. Reducing speed limits, placing buildings close to the street, planning for a network of destination with paths and sidewalks close to and convenient to homes and stores and offices. Secondly, housing. It says allow for a variety of housing. Single family, in-law flats, multi-family, new, new infill developments, mixed housing with nearby retail, etc., etc. Third, it talks about retail development and says that it's important to transform malls into hubs for the community and allow for multiple uses with housing or offices above stores and to tolerate non-conforming uses, if you want to put it that way, in your zoning. Fourth, it talks about office development and says, Plan employment closer and more accessible to housing services and retail stores. And finally, it talks about preserving open space and the environment, reducing stormwater runoff, and providing additional filtering of treated wastewater and all the rest of it. Don't have time to go into it all, but it's a great primer for smart growth. Let me just conclude this part of the lecture by saying that I think smart growth is a three-legged triangle of economic viability, environmental sensitivity, and community livability. There's no magic answer. And certainly in Indianapolis, we have a long ways to go, and we had a long ways to go when I left office. But there's a challenge there, 
and the challenge is to try to deal with growth in such a way as to maintain the regional form that we all uh, value. And so now let's uh, turn to the slides and I'll see what I can do in the next 20 minutes or so to uh, illustrate some of the things I've been talking about. Now, I'm punching. There we go. Oh, wait a minute. That's too fast. Got to go back. There we go. My fellow Americans, there's the all-American city of Indianapolis, <laughs> as it looks today. Why doesn't... Oh, I'm, I'm reversing it. I'm pushing the wrong button. Pardon me. That's supposed to be the last slide. See, as you can tell, I'm not very familiar with this. Those are scattered housing lots in Indianapolis. Nothing particularly there to recommend them, I don't think. Uh, that's uh, sort of a sprawl, gobbling up the farmland. Look at Castleton, how it's grown. You're all familiar with Castleton? up there on the northeast side of Indianapolis. That's 1972. That's 1982. That's 1990. Can't walk anywhere. Got to get in your car to go from one store to another almost. You can walk into Center Mall, but anywhere else, can't walk. Sprawl. Levittown. Sprawl. Muncie. Muncie. Sprawl. That's not Muncie, I don't think. That's Fishers, Indiana, right there. And notice how the uh, subdivisions don't line up very well. I'd call that almost bad sprawl, but I've got to be careful about my neighbors in Indianapolis. Well, one of the things we tried to do, and there you can see the corner of uh, Washington Street in Illinois with the Arts Garden on top of the mall, or on top of that intersection, was to reinforce downtown by bringing the arts downtown. And this is a uh, 12,500 square foot arts garden as a component of the Circle Center Mall. This is Benjamin Harrison's home again downtown. Uh, Harrison, President of the United States, uh, re resided in the 16 room mansion, with the exception of his four years in the White House from 1875 until his death in 1901, downtown. Historic preservation. This is the Circle City Classic, which features parades and celebrities and marching bands and special units, and is downtown. We tried to bring people downtown. That's why we built the Dome Stadium, downtown. This is the Children's Museum. Whether measured by size, the number of visitors, or the number of artifacts, the Children's Museum of Indianapolis is the world's largest. Where is it? Almost downtown, about 30th and Meridian. It reinforces a neighborhood that was in danger of serious deterioration. Its 55-foot atrium includes a welcome center, a museum store, or two. It has a, a place for youngsters to pl practice climbing a rock. It has a Space Quest planetarium, which some of you may have seen. And during the holidays, the Children's Museum is transformed into a winter wonderland downtown in one of our most difficult neighborhoods on the near north side. Now moving along, there's the Indianapolis Canal. It used to be back in the 1970s that on the other side of that canal was an old dump where they put uh, cars and all kinds of refuse and uh, materials that were going to be recycled. And it was just a metal scrap heap. And that canal didn't amount to much as it was given to the city by the Indianapolis Water Company and ran all the way down from Broad Ripple to the White River. So now we've got the canal walk development, which is uh, hopefully uh, going to make a big difference in downtown. This is the Idle George Museum. You probably are familiar with that. And they, they have various different kinds of festivals there. Again, downtown, bringing life to the downtown area. 
we deliberately decided that we would build the Dome Stadium downtown as a expansion of the convention center. It was the first of its kind in the country. We doubled the exhibit space. People don't believe it when I say it was just a coincidence that we had 100 yards of concrete out in the middle of the stadium. Uh, but we have tractor pulls in there and religious conventions. The NCAA plays their basketball there, you know, and all the rest of it. It's not just a single-use facility for 12 days a year, eight days a year when the Colts play there and win once in a while. <laughs> and I'm a big Colts fan. This is the... Uh, drawing for the new field house, which has gone up since I left town. The Conseco field house, which is now under construction, will resemble an old-fashioned basketball field house when completed in 1999. And there's, that's the inside of it. And then the, uh, another rendering of it. It's going to be a great addition to our city. Now, there's a whole other discussion in the way in which perhaps uh, cities are held up by professional sports franchises, but I won't go into all that now. Uh, but it's a problem. The, the point of these three slides, and I don't have time to go through them all, is the economic impact of amateur sports, uh, job creation and uh, broadening of the tax base and so forth. And the uh, bottom line is that the total impact of the commitment that we made of about $160 million to building sports facilities in Indianapolis as we sought to leverage economic development by this commitment to what you might call an amenity, namely sports, the total impact was $1.89 billion. And that's not a bad return on the investment. If we move on, we've got the Indianapolis Museum of Art located on 152 acres that include botanical gardens and a greenhouse and all the rest of it. And they've got uh, various different kinds of festivals, including an Africa Fest, which features demonstrations of African crafts. You all know about the Speedway and what that's done for Indianapolis. You all know about the way in which uh, we were known for many years as a town that watched the race one day a year and slept the other 364. And, uh, as Time Magazine said, when the Colts came to town, India, no place is no more, and we woke up. Detroit Free Press said about the same time, Indianapolis is awake year-round now. All nice compliments. The 500 Festival uh, runs a mini-marathon. It conducts a, uh, a lot of festival events in downtown Indianapolis, again, to try to bring that core together. Uh, that's a picture of the president of the city council up there at the top. No, I, I don't mean that. I just can't help putting that in. More culture downtown, performing arts in the old Circle Theater. This is what it looks like now, and this is what it looked like before the restoration. I went in there one day when there were cobwebs hanging off it. It was all dark. I went in there with Frank McKinney, Jr., the head of AFNB, and uh, John Nelson, who was the conductor for the symphony orchestra or music master, or whatever he was called. But anyway, Nelson clapped his hands and said, this is a good place, and they were going to have to leave Clues Hall, so we brought him downtown. Uh, here again, we've got Circle Center, and uh, we're very proud of that. We hope that it works out. It took 17 years to bring that project to fruition. I wrote to Simons a letter in 1977, and just now is it coming to pass. And we hope that it'll be a success as we go down the trail. It combines, as you know, uh, shopping with uh, various different kinds of entertainment, restaurants, dining, and, and all the rest of it. This is Alexander Ralston's plan of the original Indianapolis, laid out very much like Washington. He was a pupil of L'Enfant. And when he came to Indianapolis, he, he laid out that rectangular grid with the diagonal streets and the circle very much as they have in Washington. So way back then, before Daniel Burnham said, make no small plans, Indianapolis was trying to make a good plan for its city, which uh, I hope was more honored in uh, the observance than in the breach. This is the Vision 2000 plan for the area in downtown Indianapolis that I referenced earlier with the river running through it, and that's for the American Legion Mall, uh, which looks pretty nice and is in green. We're often uh, ridiculed for it. And for the circle, John Gunther in his book Inside USA calls it the 
second ugliest monument in the country, uh, or in the world, I guess he says. Uh, he wasn't very kind of the Hoosier State in that book published in 1946, Inside USA. But anyway, it's the center of our city, the center of our festive life in the, in the springtime, the summertime, the fall and the winter. And uh, I think a, a real landmark that gives a signature. Every major region needs a signature, whether it's the Arch in St. Louis or the Monument Circle in Indianapolis. And there we have our good friend Reggie canning a three-pointer. And we have our famous Larry Bird as the coach because we use sports to leverage opportunity. There, now, now it's the RCA Dome when I built it, and when we built it, it was not that. It was the, uh, of course, the Hoosier Dome. The Indiana State House has been refurbished and is really uh, quite something. This is Victory Field, the new field, again downtown. See the skyline? A beautiful, beautiful field. Major, major league, minor league ballpark, if you want to put it that way. And here we are, uh, sort of out at the zoo. Uh, which is an interesting place. I don't know how many of you have been there, but it's located on the banks of the beautiful White River in downtown Indy, and uh, it does a great job of attracting people to the uh, downtown. There's a Harrison home again. I don't know how he got stuck in there. Well, there's Lockerbie. And you see what we are trying to do there is to create the kind of uh, place, or sense of place in downtown Indianapolis that roots people there. Back in the 60s, those homes could have been bought for three to five thousand dollars. Now you can't touch them for probably a uh, hundred. We did a lot of infill housing while I was mayor. Uh, the the kids from a tech high school worked with architects and construction people to design and build these houses, which were uh, put into uh, places in the near downtown, along, for example, Central Avenue. And uh, they fit in very nicely, and they gave these young people a, a feeling of pride and a feeling that perhaps they had a great contribution to make uh, in the future to the building of cities, which is really what it's all about and certainly what you all are involved in as planners and uh, architects to be. So there are the kids working on the, the tech high school students working on their, their buildings. And it, it's made a big difference. And you can see them if you drive down Central Avenue, some of those, those places. Here we have uh, something. <laughs> oh, I know what it is. It's the canal, an amenity that has been changed dramatically over the years. We worked awful hard at it, spent a lot of money on it. Dick Luger helped us with getting some intermodal transportation money for it. And if you'll pardon my bragging, I think now it's a thing of beauty and a joy forever, but it sure wasn't 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, this is uh, some of the residential development downtown. We ran a study by Leventhal and Horwath in the early 1980s that said there'd be room for 5,000 new units in downtown Indianapolis residential units. I don't have a picture of, Lock, of Lockfield Gardens, which is nearly uh, adjacent to this. This is the... Uh, the Indianapolis Glove Factory, and uh, I lived up there on the top floor for the last three or four years that I was mayor, trying to put my money where my mouth was, uh, as it were, and that's our neighbors uh, in, in uh, Lockerbie Square. And uh, here we have, <laughs> is that Lockerbie again? Yeah, now here we have Seascape, that's what I thought, or Seaside, that's what I thought we were getting to. This is a new urbanist community. And Andres Diwani and his wife and the others who are involved in the new urbanist movement, neo-traditionalism, it's sometimes called, do a very good job of explaining how to make a smallish community pedestrian friendly, situated around or clustered around a central gathering place so that people can have a sense of community and a sense of place. And it's, it's nationally known as a breakthrough in uh, urban design. And this is it a little closer up. Now the last slide I have is one of the skyline of Indianapolis uh, in the uh, evening. And I'd like to close these remarks by sharing with you the last paragraph. It's terrible for me to quote myself, but I sort of like this paragraph and I'm going to read it to you. And if you fall asleep with the dark lights, okay. But I, I began this book and I end this book with Philadelphia. Talking, talking at the front end about them saying Philadelphia is dying. 
then going through the book talking about what I call harbingers of hope and saying at the end that maybe Philadelphia is not dying. Maybe Philadelphia is changing and transitioning from an industrial age city to a post-industrial age city. And we're right in the middle of those growing pains. But anyway, I say, take a drive or a hike near sunset to Fairmount Park in Philadelphia, or for that matter, and then I name a number of other hills uh, that overlook uh, beautiful cities in America. I decided not to use Crown Hill uh, because I knew that it was closed and you probably couldn't get up in there at midnight to see the city. But uh, anyway, this is a nice view of the Indianapolis skyline at night. Take a drive or a hike near sunset to any of these places. See the sunset, then watch the city down below begin to twinkle with myriad points of light. The city is alive, vital, pulsating, dynamic, not static, forever changing, eternally old, eternally new, stumbling, rebounding, dying, and being reborn. Those who love the cities of America and are dedicated to responsible land use and to the art and practice of cityship, which is a word I coined in this book for leadership in the city and partnership with the city and stewardship of the city and that kind of thing, and to the art and practice of cityship, may see a positive sign in these lights. They're harbingers of hope, shining in the darkness, not being overcome by it. Some have been extinguished, to be sure. They glow no longer. Others are fluttering and faint, candles in the wind, but others are shimmering brightly and beautifully, and new ones are being turned on even as you watch. And then there are some lights that illumine the night sky like beacons pointing to the stars. Our calling is not to curse the darkness in the great metropolises and cities and towns where we live. Our calling is to keep the lights of urban America burning and not let them flicker out. Thank you very much.